This is the Business Storytelling Show, a top global marketing podcast listened to in more than 100 countries, live streamed on social media, and broadcast on DBTV. Christoph Trapp chats with industry leaders to help your company tell better business stories. Here's today's episode. Let's go, business storytellers. How's everyone doing? I'm looking over to the side here because this is the first episode I'm doing with Otter AI live transcribing the entire show. Amazing. AI, how did we ever live without it? I don't know. Um, And it's not taking anybody's job because nobody was transcribing this baby beforehand. So anyway, fantastic tool. Definitely would recommend it if you need a link, let me know in the comments or drop me an email. Today, we're going to continue our series this week on where should different things live in an org chart. We talked about in the last episode earlier this week, we talked about content, how content should be its standalone department. As a content guy here, I probably I don't have any objection to that at all. It actually makes sense to me. Why shouldn't they stand on their own and not just be part of marketing so they can age, help HR, communications, maybe public relations, who knows. But today we want to talk about where should communications live in an org chart? Because I know many of you love creating org charts so we can look at who reports to who and whatnot. So Grace Williams, she's joining me on the show today. She's SVP uh, at a B2B SaaS media relations agency, Blast Media. Grace, welcome to the show. Hi. (laughs) Good to see you. Good to be here. Nice to see you as well. Um, So, you know, it's interesting how like these two episodes just kind of lined up, you know, we're talking about where should content live and where should, you know, we've talked about that plenty of times, where should different things live. But why is communications? Why? I mean, why is that an important topic? Maybe we'll just start one by one here. Um, First of all, what is communications on in a company? And how does that typically look? Yeah, I was listening to your other episode and kind of also listening to you talk about, you know, where content should live. And I I have a feeling that maybe we're going to make a similar argument here for communication. So everyone's going to eventually end up in their in their own little silo. Um, But yeah, communications, it's a broad it's a broad function, right? Um, it, it encompasses a lot of things for organizations. It's the management of all of the messaging that's coming out of your company to your different audiences. And those audiences could be internal. They could be, you know, your employees. It could be your investors, your customers, um, the media, obviously, that's a big one um, that my organization Blast uh, plays into. Um, could be government bodies or regulators, um, any industry peers or analysts, right? There's, there's tons of different audiences that that you need to communicate with on a regular basis to kind of maintain different things like relationships and reputation, brand image. So um, communications kind of encompasses, you know, all of those different activities. And and within communications, of course, there's different subspecialties for all of those things, right? Um, We work mostly with the press and we work in media relations. But when we're working with analysts, you know, that's analyst relations. There's things like crisis communications, internal communications, executive communications, um, customer communications that are all their own kind of subspecialties that exist with under that really big communications umbrella. You know, I think what a lot of people struggle with is that one type of communication isn't necessarily another type of communication. And it's kind of like when you even writing or content, right? I mean, you can be a writer and you can be really good at certain types of writing, but that doesn't mean you're going to be really good at other types of writing. Um, And certainly that makes sense. But how does a company even know what kind of internal communications they need? I mean, all those things you just mentioned, I'm like, oh, you need this and you need that too. And oh my goodness, internal communication, of course. But like, how do you even like, I mean, who has the budget? <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's it's a great point. I, I would say that communications is uh, severely underfunded, probably at most organizations to have all the functions that are probably necessary or needed. Um, but just like any other department, when you're scaling, certain things become you know more important as, as you grow. Maybe internal communications or having a specific Um, internal communications cadence isn't really necessary if you are a scrappy startup where everyone is on Slack together all the time kind of discussing similar things. Maybe it matters a lot more when you reach 
200, 500 people and your CEO needs to start sending, you know, a weekly note. Um, does your CEO have capacity to do that herself or does she need, you know, support from someone who's doing internal comms? My organization um, is growing and we recently started a monthly employee newsletter because Slack became sort of overrun with too many things to where things were missing as far as like, you know, when is your assessment due and what days do we have off upcoming and what company activities do we have? Um, and so we, you know, created an internal uh, communications role in my organization recently as well. So I think you kind of assess things as you grow. Um, but having someone fundamentally that is in charge of those communications activities and can say, hey, now's the time that we need to be leaning into media relations. We have, um, we're trying to raise our series A. Um, and so we need to get in front of an investor audience. And a really good way to do that is by getting some top tier coverage and entrepreneur and Inc. We need to invest right now into media relations. Um, so having that kind of head of comms or that chief communications officer, if you will, is going to be that person that's going to help you to decide, like, when do we need kind of to ramp up these different functions? One of my favorite stories still remains for internal communications um, remains the it was a bank and they were trying to ramp up their internal communications. So they started doing a podcast because, you know, internal podcasting is actually a thing. And we did have an episode. I don't know how long ago, but it's been a while. Todd Cochran uh, with Blueberry. And if you want to listen to that, but this uh, bank CEO recorded an internal podcast and sent it out. And a teller came up to him and said, you know, we can't listen to this. We're at a teller station. So now, you know, they have to wear headphones. So it's something to think about if you do internal communications. Um, you know, can people actually consume it? Will they consume it? I'm not a big fan of the big quarterly update, honestly. Who has time to read it? It's full of right. marketing gobbledygook. Right. But talking about marketing gobbledygook and, and getting actual placements in media. So when you were talking about that, getting into Inc. and other places, um, do you, like, are you talking about, like, should these be paid placements or organic placements or what's like, uh, what's the role nowadays of communications in that area? Yeah. So when you're talking about media relations specifically, um, I mean, absolutely both paid and earned are going to be important pieces of the puzzle. Um, mostly what, you know, the agency that I work at handles is earned coverage. So things that we're not paying for, um, which is why relationship building is, is so, so important. Um, we're trying to keep in constant contact with these journalists, you know, give them feedback on what they're writing about, hopefully be a source for them in a way that is not just serving our clients, but is helpful to them also. Um, but paid is, you know, not an unimportant piece of the puzzle. If you're paying for advertorial placements, um, you know, that kind of blur the line between advertorial editorial. Um, but if you're paying for um, coverage, so to say, you're going to be able to get more, a lot more promotional messaging in there, right? Like a lot of things that we're doing at, at my organization is going to be skirting um, the line of being vendor neutral, right? Um, if you're in HRIS and, and you're doing PR through media relations, we're going to be maybe placing a piece about the importance of um, having all of your people data in one place and how that can help your organization function a little bit better versus five reasons you should buy this HRIS. If you're paying for coverage, it's going to be able to have, you know, a lot more direct line to, hey, click this link and, and attend this webinar, download this ebook or whatever the, the conversion is going to be. Um, but yeah, we're talking about earned coverage um, at, at my agency and, and that's, um, you know, deciding what, what pieces are newsworthy, you know, what do we want to, what are the messages that we want to communicate to press? Um, what, what kind of coverage do we want. We want coverage in customer facing, you know, trade publications where our buyers might actually be reading and, and what are our buyers pain points and how can we speak to those pain points? Or do we have a really big news piece or does our founder have a really cool story? Um, we have a, a female founder um, who, you know, had some experiences with VCs that weren't so great. And she felt like every room that she walked into, um, she was getting told no. And it was a bunch of white guys at the table telling her no. And she finally found a VC that was a fit. Um, and she kind of told that story to Inc of, you know, I'm a female founder and this is what my experience was um, pitching these, you know, all white male VCs and how terrible it was for me. So is there a cool human interest story there that we can latch on to? So um, looking at kind of media relations holistically for what it can do for your organization, I think too, um, if you are scaling, if you are growing, what kind of coverage can we get that's about your company culture? Do you have any cool um, 
workplace perks? Do you have a four day work week? Um, you know, do, do you believe in work life balance? Do you believe that they should be totally separate? What are your thoughts there? Um, there's lots of different ways that we can go with it. Um, but yeah, we're, we're most talking about earned coverage and, and you should be able to secure it on a regular basis if you have a good PR agency for sure. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, your paid isn't also important and doesn't have a place in the mix too. I also found that earned coverage sometimes just happens the more you're out there. I mean, I was just quoted in an article in a, in a bigger publication and I didn't reach out to them. They reached out to me and they said, hey, we saw you talk about this stuff. Uh, you know, can you give us your opinion? And they used like one sentence from like three paragraphs I send them, uh, which is pretty typical, I think, in journalism. But, you know, paid, I, you know, I grew up in journalism. And if you would have asked me this 20 years ago, I would have said, oh, paid, oh, gross. But, you know, we have paid guests on this show and most of those episodes are exactly like this one and any other one. We're just talking, you know, and, and they're sharing whatever they want to share. And I ask whatever I want to ask for the most part. And it's just like, I think the, the line of, you know, a paid campaign doesn't mean it's just an ad, right? As you said, but advertorial has a bad taste in some people's mouth too in some industries right um, I, think also, I think also maybe um maybe readers don't always know the difference between advertorial and editorial and i mean that in a good way for the person that's paying for the spot um there are now things that are kind of in between paid and organic so forbes councils are a really big thing right you can pay to be part of this council and you can pay to have a, a profile on forbes it's really not a large investment. It's like probably three thousand dollars for the year, and you can get a couple pieces on Forbes that are that have your byline. And you can get a couple quotes, quote placements. That's very different from a sponsored piece on, say, HBR that that might cost you fifty thousand dollars on its own. Um, and so there's different investment levels, and and you know journalism is changing very drastically, and newsrooms are shrinking. Um, we're seeing a lot more paywalls, and that's because these organizations, you know, need to have revenue incoming that's not just from uh, sponsors. Um, and so I think we have to kind of change with the times and change what our interpretation is to where maybe previously advertorial would have been a really big negative, kind of like you were talking about. And now we're finding ways to kind of integrate the two. You know, not to go down this rabbit hole any longer, but the last comment I will make is like everything I do is corporate storytelling, business storytelling, right? So there's a business reason why it exists. But people say all the time, oh, this is so interesting, right? This is kind of, this is really interesting. So it is not bad content. It's just, you know, the purpose of it existing is different from journalism. Right. Now, we talked about, um, you know, how do you create a content department earlier this week? And of course, somebody needs to lead it. And you already mentioned that too. Even if you don't have a communications team separately, somebody has to lead the effort. And certainly, I know that no program I've ever seen work has worked without somebody owning it. And then if that person leaves into a different job or a different team, you know, the thing just kind of disappears. But how do companies go about creating a communications team? Like what, like who is the, for lack of a better term, who's the perfect hire to lead that? It's a good question. Who's the perfect hire to lead a communications team? Um, I would say... Uh, it's hard to say someone with a background in communications, but someone that's a really good writer. That's what I'll say. Um, and that's something that uh, this is a, like a throwback to my childhood. But my mother always told me that if you know how to write, you can get a job anywhere. Um, and if you know how to tell a good story, if you know how to write a good story, um, I think you're going to be a good communications person. Um, a lot of I would say former journalists, you know, there are journalists that have been laid off. Um, there are journalists who have lost their jobs or are looking to kind of go to the brand side. Those would be good individuals to lead a communications team. Um, someone that, you know, historically communications has lived inside of marketing. Um, and so someone that is a brand marketer, but more focused on the brand side, the storytelling side, then maybe the demand gen side or the numbers side would be a good communications person. Someone that has worked with executives, um, maybe you've been, um, you've prepared decks for executives, you have been a speechwriter for executives, um, you're really good at distilling down, you know, complex information or being told a bunch of things and being able to write that out into bullets. Um, those would all be, you know, good types of people. Um, understanding marketing is key. You know, historically communications has, has lived inside of marketing. And so um, those are people you're going to have to work with on a regular basis. You're going to have to understand um, the campaigns that they're running, the customer communication, customer communications that they're running, um, what their goals are. And so I think having a, bar a, a background in, in marketing or, or journalism, you know, would be, would be good hires. 
You know, this is a theme I keep hearing over and over and over. Everything lives within marketing. I mean, seriously, is that? Um, and then when I even when I wrote is marketing good career, you know, I talk about all these different things that you could be doing in marketing because people ask me, well, is marketing good career, like literally the, the title of the book. Um, and it depends on what you're good at, depends on who they need. But why is everything in marketing? Is that just because people haven't figured out that? Is that just the default because we used to have a marketing team, but we didn't have these other teams yet? Or why has it evolved into that? Yeah, I think marketing has become a catch-all uh, for things that maybe don't fit other places, or or maybe marketers have grabbed at things that they feel you know that they that they could oversee, so that they can kind of climb the corporate ladder, so to say, right? Like, okay, if I oversee design and ABM and comms and demand gen, maybe I can become a CMO. That's my path to the C-suite. I think there's a lot of different reasons, um, but the burden on marketers is one of the main reasons that I believe communication should live outside of marketing. Um, they have to do so much, right? Like they have to know everything about everything, analytics and, and data and how to integrate AI into their campaigns and how to reach customers and how to run email marketing campaigns. And then there's also the entire like video design aspect, social. I mean, it's huge, 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 huge. The burden on them is huge. And think about someone that's Entering marketing, like you said, is marketing a good job? I don't know. What the heck are you doing inside of marketing? Um, and, you know, I, I'm a believer that I think it's good to know about everything, but being a specialist is probably what's going to make you really good at your job and, and really valuable to an organization. Um, and so if there are lots of different specialists within, I think it's helpful um, instead of people that kind of, you know, are more of a jack of all trades or know a little bit about everything. And I know there's some companies they're trying to push this T-shaped marketer concept or T-shaped communicator, right? You can do a lot of things, but you're not an expert at any of them. And I, I certainly believe, I mean, I did not grow up as a broadcaster, even though I've, I've been on TV before in my journalism career. But, you know, I wouldn't have said, hey, I'm a producer, like, let's produce a podcast, like never would have crossed my mind, just kind of, you know, fell into that and, and, and learned things. Um, but as people are thinking about becoming a communi communications professional, what kind of training should they go after? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, if you want to be in comms, I'm going to stick by my advice that you need to know how to write um, and you need to know how to write in a way that's better than what ChatGPT or Bard can produce, um, because those tools are, are certainly you know, ramping up their ability to write content. Um, but a human really is going to be better at, at making sure something resonates with other humans. Um, so writing is really important. Relationship building is extremely important, especially when you're talking about media relations. Um, you know, someone that's interested in reading and interested in news, um, depending on what industry you're working in, if you're working in HR, if you're working in IT, um, caring about the vertical that you're inside of, um, being able to, you know, communicate quickly with executives um, and convince them and get their buy-in. Um, when you live inside communications, you don't have a direct line to revenue in the way that marketers do. Um, and so you need to be able to convince them why an employee newsletter is going to be a good idea, why an employee podcast might be a good idea, why you should take time out to um, take this interview with CNBC, um, why it matters that we brief analysts on a quarterly basis, those sorts of things, because they're not going to be able to see the direct return on investment as other activities like a demand gen campaign. And so a background in being a persuasive person, being a good writer, um, being someone who likes to consume a lot of information, um, all of those things I think are important. And being a people person, you're going to have to work with lots of people. <laughs> you do have to work with a lot of people. And it took me a while to throw it back up here. Is marketing a good career? You can scan that book right there and grab it over on Amazon. Of course, it's an affiliate link, but it's my book anyway. So uh, it's not like I'm pitching somebody else's content. Now, you know, what's interesting, I'm glad you mentioned and you kind of stuck to your guns there on, on the whole writing thing. And I use um, AI every day for all kinds of different things, right? But never for writing, because I think if I have to see one more unleash in a headline, I'm going to throw up <laughs> because unleash 
seriously is an AI thing. I don't think anybody ever has used Unleash as much as AI uses that today. So something to keep in mind, the writing matters, but you can certainly use AI for outlines, even for questions on podcasts. I just did that earlier today. I said, I'm doing a podcast on this topic. What are some 10 good questions? And you know, a third of them were kind of garbage and, you know, four of them were pretty good and the others were kind of, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't really need them. So something to keep in mind. Uh, maybe in two minutes here, tell me about how do we stand up a communications team? We talked about that in content. We've talked about it in other teams. How do we get it out of marketing and, and start its own team? How is that doable? Yeah. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I wrote I wrote a piece uh, for PR Daily about this in January. That was you know 2023 is going to be the year of the chief communications officer. I'm still hopeful that it will be. Um, and then even just this last week, I don't know if you've seen, but there have been a couple kind of PR influencers on LinkedIn that have been posting about this exact topic: how do we get communications out from underneath marketing? Um, one PR influencer in particular had kind of the perspective that they think marketing should report into communications. I won't say that I totally believe that. And then the other one was just kind of talking about the differences between the jobs. Um, and, you know, I don't think that communications should ever be so siloed that it becomes anti-marketing, which is what some of the language I think on LinkedIn has been in the past week or so. Um, and that should be the case for any organization. But if you think about like a finance department, a finance department supports HR, a finance support department supports sales. Um, and I think of communications like that as well, right? Like there's communications that need to happen for HR. There's communications that need to happen for sales. There's communications that need to happen for marketing. There's communications that need to happen for executives. So, um, you know, why should we be kind of underneath marketing when we're reaching out to these different parts of the organization as well? So how to stand it up is, you know, change your reporting structure, get more face time with your CEO. Um, if you are someone who is, you know, a senior vice president of communications, you're underneath the CMO, um, make an effort to showcase more of your successes to your executive team, make an effort to get a slide in your board deck um, and showcase some of your, your KPIs or your OKRs. Um, and start showcasing your value directly to your executive team, not always through your CMO. Um, obviously, hopefully you can do that with the support of your CMO. I think they would probably be supportive of that. Um, but just make yourself seen and make sure that they understand the entirety of kind of what is under communications. It's not just one thing. It's very interesting. And I, you know, I know you mentioned reporting into whoever, and I mentioned that a couple of times I already took a little bit of a stab here at everybody who wants to report uh, have people reporting to them, but maybe it's not so much about reporting anyways. Maybe it's more about how do you have these teams that get stuff done? I think when you look at, you know, who's reported, I mean, sure, somebody has to hold somebody accountable at some point potentially, but at the end of the day, you know, why do we have to create too many layers? Why can't we just go get the job done? And maybe I'm just being a little bit too idealistic about this. Um, Grace, it was great to have you on the show in the last minute here. Or so tell me, um, Blast Media, like who should reach out? Who do you work with? Who's your perfect client, so to speak? Yeah, so uh, Blast Media is where I work. Uh, we're a media relations agency, um, communications agency for software companies. So software as a service SaaS companies. We've been around for 18 years. We're based in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, we're really great at securing coverage. We're really great at supporting kind of any communications initiatives that you have on deck, whether that is internal, whether it is external, um, helping with speaking you know, programs, award submissions earning coverage, things like that. So um, you can check us out at blastmedia.com. You can certainly reach me. Um, I'm happy to also just chat like communications topics with literally anyone who wants to talk about it. Part of my job is just staying up to date on what's happening in comm. So I'm grace at blastmedia.com where you can always um, look me up on LinkedIn as well. Thanks for tuning in. Please rate and review the business storytelling show on your favorite podcast platform, and subscribe so you don't miss the next episode.